The sun has left and forgotten me. It's dark, I cannot see. Your stories don't define you, but how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker at Elkins Consulting. Just a quick reminder for listeners who are interviewing for jobs, our new course, Get Hired Job Interview Storytelling, is available for just $199, and it includes a storytelling practice session. So visit elkinsconsulting.com for more information. Now, you've probably been listening to this podcast for a while, so you know that I'm always diving deeply into authenticity, identity, and relevance. And today's guest, Jen Donahue, will just fit this so well, and I'm really excited to start chatting with her. So, Jen, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Sarah. I'm just excited to be here. Excellent. So tell me, I, I'm, I know that I sent this in an email in preparation. Um, I love to ask my guests to share something about themselves that most people don't know about them, something that's not on their resume or cover letter. And I am looking at your expression, and of course our audience can't see it, but you clearly have something in your head and you're ready to share. So let's get started. One of the things that I absolutely love is animals. And I know that that's not on my resume anywhere or anything like that, but I am, I have been allergic to animals my entire life. And it's just absolutely broken my heart for years that I could not have had an animal. But the very weird thing happened whenever I went over to Iraq. I don't know what happened, but I came back and I don't have allergies anymore. I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but now I have one cat and two dogs and absolutely no allergy problems. So that's, I don't think I've ever told that to really any other person. I think, wow, that's amazing. And how fortunate. Are you an animal magnet? Do they come to you just naturally? They do which was so hard whenever I was allergic to, you know, dogs and cats, I'd like blow up like a balloon, you know, whenever they were near. But now they can come up to me and it's like, oh, it's just so much fun, you know, pet all the dogs and all the cats. And it just makes me so happy. Oh, I love that. That is a new one. I have interviewed <laughs> hundreds of people and that is not one I've heard before. That just made me so happy because I am, I, I love animals and creatures in general and especially dogs. But I, I love hearing somebody else that had that opportunity after not having that opportunity. Wow. That's amazing. I wonder if it had something to do with drying everything out. Were you in the desert in the summer when it was like 130 degrees out there? It was. It was really hot. Uh, it was 120 degrees at 9 a.m. in the morning. And so I'm not actually sure how hot it got because that was just as high as the thermometers went. Uh, at that point, you just don't really want to know. But maybe that's what it was. Maybe it just dried everything out and I have not had a problem since. Wow. I wonder if that's a thing, like if other people have experienced that. So, well, um, we should probably you know, move on because I know <laughs> at some point this will come back around. It always does. It always ends up generating more conversation later on as we dive into the, the stories that define who you are. So for our listeners' sake, I would love for you to tell us what you do without telling us what you do. So what that usually means is telling a story about a recent work experience that really brought you great satisfaction. Okay. One of the most interesting things that I've done lately is I have just completed the seismic analysis for 172 dams throughout California and making sure that we have the right information in case there is a large earthquake to know if they are going to fail or have any problems. Wow. Oh my gosh, that's that's huge in many ways. <laughs> it, it's also impactful. I, I was thinking huge in terms of impactful, but it's both. Wow, is there one dam in particular that pops into your head when you think about that experience? Because I'm assuming you had to go to all of them. I've gone to several of them, but on the most part, what we do is we just need the information about the faults and the geology. And we hand this over to different types of engineers who are able to take and, and analyze that data. But I'm the one that comes up with all of the different types of ground motions for how much your dams are going to shake during an earthquake. And so I know this is really relevant because uh, recently we've had 
the very large earthquake in Turkey, and we're doing lots of analysis um, on the dams that potentially failed over there. And so I can use the data that I have to try to match what happened over there to see if we might still have some of the same problems here in the United States. Wow, that's so cool. How long have you been doing this kind of work? Since about 2003. I became an, I became an earthquake engineer starting in 2003. Wow. And you lived in California for a long time, right? The Bay Area? I did. Uh, I started there in 2000 and just moved up to Oregon in 2020. So a good, well, at least in the San Francisco Bay Area, I was there starting in 2000. But while I was in the military, I was stationed down in Southern California and I was down there for about five or six years. Wow. So when you think about this whole earthquake fascination, I mean, clearly that's something that has been a thing for you. I don't think anyone just randomly ends up in that kind of work. When you think about that, what do you think triggered that, so to speak? I keep punning. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> I love the puns. I do. <laughs> well, I started out as an ocean engineer and I was in, I grew up in West Texas, which absolutely makes no sense whatsoever that I became an ocean engineer. But I love the dynamics of engineering and building in these environments where it's not static, but there's always some type of force that is acting on your structure that you have to somehow overcome. And to me, that's really exciting. But whenever I moved out to California after I got off active duty, I needed to take the professional engineer's license. And as part of that, you had to learn about seismic. Well, being from Texas, you didn't really have a whole lot of seismic classes. So I started taking some seismic classes and realized, hey, this is just like ocean engineering, except it's now on the land where you have all these different forces that are trying to take down your buildings and your dams and your bridges and all of that. And like you have to be able to maintain all of that. And for me, that was so exciting because it's not just building a building. Oh, there's so many forces from earthquakes that you really have to dive into and understand in order to make it sustainable and make it safe for people. Wow. <laughs> I keep saying wow, because everything you're saying is so fascinating to me. Uh, first of all, thank you for the work that you do, because I, I understand the consequences of not having people who are as devoted and and ambitious in terms of that kind of science. If we don't have you, we have really big problems. So thank you for your work. You're welcome. And also, I know um, one of the things that startled me the most about an earthquake, well, I, I lived in LA when I was in elementary school, and we lived in the San Fernando Valley, a little area called Chatsworth. And I remember one time I was out in the garage with my brother and we felt the earthquake start and we started to go into the house, which probably was a little safer than being in the garage where stuff was up high on shelves and stuff. And I will never forget my brother grabbing me by the hand and yanking me up the stairs just as a large block of wood fell off of a tall shelf and landed on the ground that would have oh, wow. really hurt me if pretty serious damage. And I remember I wasn't that scared during the earthquake, but I do remember being fascinated by the sound the earth made. And then we had a big earthquake here in Helena, Montana, just a few years ago. And we woke up, it was like midnight or one in the morning. And I heard it before I felt it. I heard the earth groan. It was like this like that. And I remember waking up and then all of a sudden our bed is banging against the wall. The headboard is banging against the wall. It was, it was a big earthquake. So what is your memory of an earthquake that, that just pops into your head when you think about earthquakes? Well, I've actually been through several of them. I think my first real experience with lots of earthquakes is when I lived on Guam and we would have these earthquake swarms. And you'd sit at your desk, and they were about a magnitude four, but they were pretty shallow, so you still get some shaking. And what would happen is that if you had to like hold on to your desk because if you had a roller chair, it would start to roll around a little bit. And so you just kind of hold on to your desk, and you just kind of like wait it out, and then and like go, okay, it's over, okay, and then you just go back to work. And we'd have these like about every sixteen hours, and so you kind of got used to, it, and it was started to be 
become fun, which sounds crazy, but that's one of the other reasons why it totally hooked me is like, this is an immense amount of energy that's being released by the earth. And I was one of the very first scientists that went over to Japan right after the magnitude nine earthquake. And while we were there, they were having magnitude 8.5 aftershocks and magnitude seven aftershocks. And it was, you couldn't even stand up. It was, you were basically being thrown around. And that was very, very memorable, you know, to feel basically like the wrath of the earth, you know, really just the upheaval was incredible. But we also made a lot of really nice scientific advancements from that earthquake. But just the feeling of, you know, seeing things just flying off your desk was just, it was immense. Right. That's not something I I think people really think about when they think of those huge earthquakes. Is there any moment that you were really, really frightened? No. And that might sound really odd, but you know that it's coming. You know where to go. You know what to do. And then at that point, you just do what you need to do. Um, there's no issue with being afraid. Uh, because you just know that you're either going to make it or you're not, which, wow, that sounds pretty dark. But you just realize, okay, I'm just going to, this is what's happening. And okay, let's just get through it. And then when it's over, you just take assessment of what's happened. And then you keep moving on. Well, you keep going back to it. So there, it can't be so frightening that you don't want to continue your studies. True. <laughs> but now I live in a place where they don't really have many earthquakes, which is kind of sad. But at the same time, uh, and like where you live now. Well, I'm looking, I know our audience can't see this, but I'm looking at the background and you have those floating shelves on the wall behind you. And I can't imagine that would ever be something <laughs> you put up in Guam. <laughs> no, nothing would have made it in Guam like that. Uh, did you Did you notice a difference? Like as far as how they decorate or how they store things because that happens every 16 hours? Oh, yes. You definitely made sure that there was no, you know, nice dishware in the cupboards, or if you did, you made sure that they were locked. Like you actually lock your your cabinets, almost like you're child proofing them so that your dishes don't come flying out. You lock your refrigerator so the refrigerator door doesn't come open and like everything comes spilling out. You know, things might get rattled around on the inside, but at least it's not going to be all over the floor. It, it's the same thing in some areas of California, whenever you look at the way that we build. Uh, a lot of times we make sure that when we're putting up our bookcases that they're anchored to the wall. And you don't have really that many fra you know, fragile objects on the bookcases or unless you have some kind of sticky that you can put underneath them. So there's all these different things that we can do to try to make sure that your valuables aren't lost in, in earthquakes. But yes, uh, what you see behind me with the floating shelves and little knickknacks up there, that would never have happened, ever have happened in Guam. And even whenever I lived in California, that would have just been a mess. Wow. I, I again, I'm not sure that's something that those of us who generally don't live in earthquake prone areas would think about, but that makes so much sense. And I'm just glad that we don't have them significantly or a lot here, but we are right on the Yellowstone caldera. So we're, we do get earthquakes, which surprises people that Montana struggles with earthquakes, but there have been some really serious damage earthquakes like the, the earthquake lake at Yellowstone that there were um, fatalities in that one. But no, it's absolutely true. Um, I recently did a, a LinkedIn article about all the different areas within the United States and what you can pretty much anticipate. And so in the Montana area and Idaho, yes, yeah, so you can experience up to about a magnitude 7, 7.2 earthquake, which is very, very damaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, we definitely have seen damage here. There was a big earthquake, I want to say it was like, Oh, probably 2005 or so, and uh, a wall of a middle school, a brick wall of a middle school collapsed, but it was the summer and no one was there. So, oh, good. It's really lucky. It's really lucky. But I remember driving by and seeing this collapsed wall. And in Montana, you just don't, I guess I didn't expect it when I moved here from Washington, D.C. So, when you think about your, moments that really make you who you are, those things that now you can look back and you can say, oh, that's that's why I'm a scientist. Or I I don't believe in the the light bulb moments where all of a sudden it's, you know, from dark to full bright. I, I 
talk a lot more about dimmer switches, but there, <laughs> but there are always incremental changes that happen. Sometimes we don't notice them until we look back, and then we see one moment that is like, okay, that was that was a big one. Can you yes. think of something like that? Yes, absolutely. I was eight years old, and I bought a Barbie dream house. And I wasn't necessarily a Barbie type of girl, but I was so excited about the dream house. And the reason why is because I got to build it. And I got to build it, and then I got to deconstruct it. And then I built it again, and then I demolished it. And I just went up and down and up and down and up and down. And I even was like, I realized it's like, oh my gosh, I can make this even better than it is. And so I actually got out a pair of scissors and started cutting the cardboard backing so that I could cut the floors apart, I cut the walls apart so that I could rearrange the whole thing. And looking back at it, I realized it's like, I love to build, I love to create. And this is one of the reasons why I'm an engineer and I do all the things that I do. And I look back and I'm like, yes, that's, you know, Harvey never actually got to live in the house because it was always under construction. <laughs> Because that's what it was all about. It was all about just creating this house and being able to build the house. So that was definitely one of those times in my life where I realized, yes, this is a very defining moment in my life. And I didn't even know what an engineer was. I thought they were the people who drove trains, you know. And so for me, I didn't really understand what that was. But now I realize going back, it's like, yes, that we're always doing that. Exactly. Exactly. Did your parents know? I mean, did they know that you would go into something building related? I don't believe they did. I'm I'm really the only person in my family that really understands math and science. I come from a family of creatives. And so I might have come from the milkman or the mailman. I'm not really sure. But um, I'm really the only person in my family who also knows how to read a map. And so I was always sort of doing my own thing most of the time. Uh, so, But all the math and science, oh, I just dove into it as a kid and I just devoured it. And my mom didn't understand, but she supported me the entire time. She's like, I don't know what you're doing, but you're loving it. So go do it. Keep so. doing it. Oh, that's awesome. So when you um, were in high school, did something, did you have a mentor or somebody that said, oh, here, here's an area of engineering that you might want to consider or somebody that just had that kind of influence on you? Not really. Um, I knew what engineers were at this point. They were not just the people who drive trains, but... <laughs> I started talking to some of my math and science teachers and they said, you know, you should probably go into some type of engineering. And when I went to Texas A&M, I started out as mechanical engineering because, because I didn't really know what type of engineer I wanted to be. I just knew that I loved it. And I wound up switching because I realized that's not necessarily the type of engineering that I wanted to do. I really wanted to build and I wanted to build in crazy environments like the ocean. And so that's why I switched over and became an ocean engineer. But I needed to get in and kind of test the waters of all the different types of engineers that there are, electrical engineers, petroleum engineers, civil engineers, ocean engineers. You know, there's so many different types of engineers. I had to kind of get in and sort of feel around a little bit and understand where my true love was. Wow. I, I keep coming back to this idea that um, because your family wouldn't have understood, and and by the way, engineers and mathematicians can be extremely creative. <laughs> My husband is a software tech guy, and he is like brilliant w about those things. And he's a musician and is a great artist. We have all kinds of paintings and stuff that he's done over the years. Wow. So yeah, I'm a big believer in engineers as also artists. And as a matter of fact, his organization, Civic Actions, when they would have the annual retreats when they were smaller and they had 40 engineers, then 50 engineers, then 60 engineers. They've grown a lot in the last 10 years. But they would, um, oh, it just rhymed. Pun the <laughs> rhyme today. Anyway, they would actually have jam sessions because so many of them were musicians. So they'd get together and rent instruments or they'd bring a guitar with them. Um, they would rent PA and they'd have these incredible jam sessions with all these engineers. So oh, amazing. Anyway, yes, off on a tangent. When I think about um, the fact that your your family could be very supportive, but they couldn't necessarily mentor you, it's kind of like um, I'm another friend whose parents didn't go to college and they were very, very supportive and excited for her to go to college, but they didn't know how to help her. Right. So who helped you? 
I mean, eventually maybe you found somebody or was it a series of people that are just not memorable as one particular influence? I think it's more of the latter. Um, I was actually the first person in my family to go to college and earn a bachelor degree. Uh, many of them had associate's degrees, but I was the first one to, to go to a four-year college and, and earn a degree. I was, I've always been very driven, you know, and someone kind of puts it in the, you know, your mind is like, hey, this is your goal. You need to go to, you need to go to college. And so it's like, okay, I can do that. How do I do it? How do I get there? How do I, how do I go forward? And I think it's because I was an only child and I was very used to being very independent. I just basically just threw myself into something and just tried to figure it out myself. There were definitely people along the way who helped and tried to guide me a little bit, you know, here and there to try to think of different ways. For instance, the mechanical engineering wasn't what I really wanted to do. And so I had to go and talk to several people. And there was one of my, one of the ocean engineering professors, his name was Professor Randall. He was amazing. And he really opened my eyes to everything that it could be. He was also prior Navy. And so he was he didn't necessarily push me towards the Navy, but just understanding what he did in the Navy and how how exciting that was, I think that's also one of the things that propelled me to go to the Navy after I graduated. But again, I'm just one of those really headstrong, very independent people that just sort of throws myself into something, which is not necessarily the right thing to do. And now I tell people, go find a mentor. <laughs> that's a mentor. I was like one or two or three. Go find a mentor. You don't have to do. Man, I'm just making things so much harder on myself because I would just <laughs> go bowling in like one area. I'll figure that. it out. I should have talked to somebody about this. Yes. Oh my gosh. You and I share that for sure. I I'm <laughs> constantly telling my younger son who's in college at University of Montana go to an advisor, even if they can't necessarily help you in the way that you want to be helped. At a minimum, have them do a, um, what do they call that? A degree audit so that you can see what you're closest to because he's changed his major a few times. He's still exploring just like what you were doing with mechanical engineering. But I keep telling him, just keep going to different ones until you find one that resonates with you, one that really understands you. So he's been better about that, but I never did that. I, I think I saw my first advisor my senior year when I realized I really needed to graduate and I didn't know what degree I was closest to. <laughs> so. you don't, I think just for us as in our generation, I don't think mentoring really is really a thing. And and I'm not sure if you agree with that or not. There just didn't seem to be a lot of people helping others unless you were the advisor and you went to go see them on your last year of college. Uh, I just didn't really see anybody that was actively mentoring when I was going through college. I saw some of it not directed at me. I don't know if it's because I wasn't looking for it, but um, I think about like my brother, for instance, he took um, a, a kind of a genetic engineering course in high school, his senior year with a teacher that really inspired him to go into that science. So, and I would call, um, Doug Lumberg, a, a mentor for my brother, for sure. He wasn't a mentor for me because science, I loved science, but it wasn't uh, the area I wanted to go into. Um, so I think that there there were some in our generation in the late 70s and 80s. I think now, though, it's intentional. Mm -hmm. I think now people are like, you know, I could probably help this person, guide them if they want my help. And I think we're more interested in really having impact, especially on younger people than than I think than I saw as a young adult. I don't remember seeing adults care that much. Even if they loved you, they didn't really think about it in terms of guidance. That, that's my perspective of it. You know, sir, I think I see the exact same thing that you did as well. Mm. That's fascinating. So this must be part of why you do what you do in terms of the public speaking you do and the the work you do to guide people, especially young women, into science, which is, oh, I'm so relieved there are people like you taking that on because it's so important. So tell me about that aspect of what you do. Well, I started out in the public speaking arena whenever I noticed that a lot of the young professionals were not getting any leadership training. They were being promoted based on their technical acumen and not necessarily because they were able to lead their group or whoever it might have been. 
And that started to irk me a little bit because of the military. It starts on day one. You learn about leadership. You learn about teamwork. You got drill instructors yelling in your face while you're doing push-ups and you start to learn all of this. And you just grow up learning about leadership and teamwork. But whenever I got into the corporate world, I noticed that it wasn't there at all. Like maybe you might get some leadership training after you've been promoted three or four times, but then you've had all these other bosses ahead of time that have had no leadership training and it just perpetuated as it went. And I just thought, I was so discouraged by this. It's like, I would really like to help young professionals get in on the ground floor of like what leadership training really is. Here's just some really easy things that they can take into their daily lives. You know, you don't even have to be a boss. You can be a leader at any level of an organization and to try to help them with that. And since then, it started to grow. And being in STEM and being an advocate for STEM, I really love going and speaking to a lot of the the universities, the engineering departments. Uh, also, there's all these different women groups, women in agile. Uh, I get to talk at a women's day event for a civil engineering group of women in Malaysia. I had to get up at 3 a.m. in the morning, but I'm excited to be there for a bit because it's. I think it's important that they're able to see other women in engineering and in the STEM fields and know that they can do it also. It's so much easier to believe that you can be someone whenever you've actually seen someone in that position before. And that's what I want to do. I want to inspire others. I want to help them. I want to make sure that their journeys maybe won't be as hard. That's something I think a lot of us in this field of of mentoring and helping people is that whole idea of making it a little easier for the next person. Because you and I, we we kind of did it our own way. And I, I hear that. Uh, and it's painful to watch people struggle. Exactly. You know, see them, you know, maybe fall into the same pits that you did. And it's like, man, I wish I could have helped them earlier. Right. You know, we always talk about, you know, as you're climbing the ladder, make sure that you're at least reaching one hand down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And especially as women, I think we have to model that with other women more than uh, more than I experienced it. I can tell you that I had real trouble with women in my career younger years and that and it was interesting because I would have men talk down to me, mm-hmm. but I would have women just be mean to me. And I would prefer the condescension, honestly. Right. And I, I think that's what really appealed to me when I saw some of what you were doing was this whole idea of, it's not just that you see yourself in STEM, that these young women can say, I want to be an engineer or at any age, if they want to go back to school at 30 or 40 or 50 and be an engineer, that they can see somebody doing that that looks like them, or at least that is a female. But on top of that, what you're doing is leading them to be leaders, not just to be scientists, but to be scientists that then can help others choose that area and bring people along. That, That whole rising tide lifts all ships comment is so true. And I, that's what I love about what you're doing is that it's not just, oh, look, you can be an engineer, but oh, look, you can be an engineer and lead others on a team effectively and in a way that feels good to you. You don't have to lead like a man would lead. Right. Exactly. There's so much to unpack with that. The way that I look at it is like, if I can help others, then they're able to help others. And it's basically like a ripple effect as it goes out. And and I understand what you're talking about with some of the women, you know, that might have been older than us. And I've studied this a lot. I know that they were the groundbreakers. I know that they were the trailblazers in, in their generation. And I know that they had to struggle. And I know that they had some incredible obstacles that they had to overcome. And a lot of them feel that unless... You work as hard as I did and go through all the same tribulations that I did. You don't deserve to be in this position. And I think that's the way that a lot of people believe that it should be. And for those who feel that way, I would like to say, maybe just look to find somebody who is similar to you and have a little bit of compassion and say, maybe I can make Maybe just for this one person that's similar to me that I know is going to scrap and I know is going to work hard. 
but just make it just a little easier. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think, you know, as we look at the different generations and, and how people view, you know, other women coming up, you know, it's like if we can maybe, if we are on that very hard line side, to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to make it my mission to just help, you know, one person that I know is similar to me and maybe make it a little bit easier. And, you know, there's all these other groups that are out there, you know, of other groups of women that are getting together that are supporting each other. And I'm so enthused to see them and how excited they are to be able to just share their stories. Okay. There's all these different groups that are out there. And it's so important. It's like, and if you feel that you're alone, they're not. No. There are so many of us out there that want to contribute. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Not alone. Absolutely not. Especially if you want to contribute. We In uh, my circle of friends with the No Longer Virtual Conference that's coming up in, in Chicago, um, one of the things we talk about is community a lot. We talk about it a lot and the distinction between community and network. Mm -hmm. And while networks are valuable, and I definitely encourage people to jump on LinkedIn and really contribute and be part of of communities within LinkedIn to build that network. But the community within is the part where you're contributing. Right. I, I don't think you can be part of the community fully unless you understand your role in it and how you can contribute. How do you give back? How do you participate? And even if that's simply sharing somebody else's work and tagging them and saying, this is somebody I'm watching. And I can't tell you how many books I purchased in the last six months of <laughs> women who are publishing books, even if it's not in my area of interest, I will buy the book. I might give it to somebody else if it's not something I want to read. I will make sure that person writes a review. It's like, I don't have to be your best friend to buy your book. I'm going to buy your book because you are a woman who has worked hard and you put something out there that is meaningful. So I hear you. We are not alone. We have a community. We really do. And it just might take a little bit to go and find that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, if, you know, I've told several people, it's like, there are others that are, that are like you. You don't have to be an island. Go find the other islands and become an archipelago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Something in the ocean. There had to be another conversation around there, right? Exactly. <laughs> Something in the ocean. <laughs> That's so, uh, it's so important for us to share that, that concept. And I am not one that joins other communities very well. I usually create one for myself. And um, there are communities that I've joined. And if you are somebody who needs to create your own community, if that's just the kind of personality you have, do that create an environment of safety and comfort for the people around you. And I guarantee you will have people that will have your back within moments of generating that that feeling, that sense of safety and, and companionship. So when you think about community, your community, that the reason you're doing what you do, what, what does that look like for you at this point in your career? I have a great community of other speakers that are also just starting out. Um, so I have a nice little group of four of us. And one of them is be now becoming wildly successful. Um, and the other hey. one started, it was like, you know, I'm just so excited for her. I mean, she is like taken off. She like got to speak at SpaceX. She's been speaking at all these different places. Wow. And I mean, she's phenomenal and she has a great message. And it's just nice that, you know, she still comes back to our little group where we're, you know, we're getting out there, but we all support each other. We're all, you know, sending texts because we're, we all started at the same point and we all went through the hardships together. And, you know, she's sort of leading the trail. And so she's giving back to us at the same time by saying, hey, you know, wow, I messed this up whenever I went to go talk here. And so she's contributing back and we're, we're all talking together. And then we have kind of a larger group that kind of goes around that as well. You know, we all support each other, but we have a nice little close knit group of four, you know, that we regularly get together and we talk about, you know, here's, here's what's going on in our lives and here's how we can support each other. Uh, it's the best thing. Uh, I, I love that because I have, I have that core group too. 
And Melissa Hughes is a dear friend of mine. She's written a couple of books. Happier Hour with Einstein is the one that I always recommend. And I always have at least one copy in my house because I'm giving it away. I've ordered multiple copies. But it, she talks a lot about gratitude and how that affects the brain physiologically. Hmm. And she did a TEDx on imposter syndrome that was outstanding. And I remember when she was first getting started with this and she really wanted to do this TEDx, she had it in her head. She knew that this was something people needed to hear. And she actually tells a story during that TEDx about when that imposter syndrome showed up with our core group. So, <laughs> which is so awesome to hear this because I'm like, I was there, that was me. <laughs> but, and it's it's a great, great TED and, and we'll have the link to that in the show notes associated with this podcast. Oh, but that, yes, it's such a good TEDx. And um, Heather Younger has also done two and she's in that group and Kimberly Davis has done one and she's in that group and I'm the only one that hasn't done one yet, but that's that's a whole other story. But anyway, the story that Melissa tells is that the four of us were sitting at um, a bar right before the no longer virtual conference was going to start. And she had that moment of, what am I doing here with these women? I don't belong here. They're wildly successful. They're so smart. They're, you know, all the things, the comparisons that pop into your head when you're wondering why are these people hanging out with me? That's what went through her head. And she stopped herself because she knew who she was with. She was in that moment and said, you guys, this is what I'm feeling right now. And all of us, of course, our response is, oh my gosh, I totally understand that. I'm kind of feeling that way too. Or, oh, Melissa, you're amazing. I, what? How is that even possible you're feeling that way? but all completely in love and support and encouragement. And the irony is that when what I remember from that same interaction was I looked around at these three women and thought, I am in exactly the right place. I am surrounding myself with women who are doing really cool stuff, things that I want to be doing in different industries, different parts of the, the kind of business that I want to be doing. And I know that surrounding myself with those women, that that's what's going to make me successful. That's that's the key to it, is that we can't compare ourselves to others and what they've achieved. You know, we have to basically look at ourselves and what we have and look for them as inspiration. Exactly. Not necessarily competition. And I think that's one of the things that's so important to realize, because trust me, I get imposter syndrome all the time. I mean, I've survived assassination attempts and like all kinds of crazy stuff. And I get imposter syndrome by hanging out with other people. And I'm like, what am I doing here? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> wait, how did I survive all that? And now I'm having these like these little bitty thoughts that creep into your brain. And so I love the fact that you basically turned it on its side and said, you know what? I'm not going to look at them as competition. I'm looking at, for them for inspiration. And that's exactly what we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I love that comment. Make sure that you're in the same, the room full of women who will, what is it? Um, they'll say your name in a room full of opportunities. Yeah, that's it. Make sure that you are in a community of women who will use your name in a room full of opportunities. And I guarantee that these women are like that. I know you're like that. I'm like that. When I meet somebody that I think is really doing great, important things and having great impact, I will not hesitate to share their name when I, I see an opportunity, a potential opportunity for them. So if you were able to just say something to a thousand listeners to this podcast, particularly women, what would you say? It all starts with belief in yourself. It's so hard. We, we tack on all these different things, but the imposter syndrome, you know, when we talk about, you know, fear of failure, when we talk about the obstacles that are in front of us, you know, what it either it's society or glass ceilings or the non-support of our family. The way that we get through all of that is a pure belief in ourselves. And it has to start there. It has to start with you. And once you have that, 
then you can go on and start tackling all of these other issues. But you have to start with the belief in yourself and realize you actually are a badass. You probably are. You don't even realize it. Like, go and find, like, what you're good at, what you love. And that's where it comes from. But you, every single one of these women that are listening to this, they are a badass in some way. I absolutely guarantee it. And if they own it, they can have that belief in themselves and they can start to overcome their own imposter syndromes and those fears of failure and all those other obstacles that might be standing in their way. Agreed. That's perfect. I love it. And I completely agree with that. You have to believe in yourself. And that's not the easy thing. That's not the easy thing. What I like to say is look at all the evidence. You, When you don't think you're good enough, you're looking at little tiny pieces of your life. But when you look at the evidence that points to all the things you've accomplished already, the things you've lived through, that you've thrived despite those those obstacles and challenges, that's what you look for. When you are starting to build that belief in yourself, look for the evidence. And I guarantee you'll find it if you start looking for it. I absolutely agree. Uh, That's awesome. Jen, this has been such a pleasure. I'm sitting here with a huge grin on my face. I'm not sure um, what to do with that right now, other than (laughs) it is a Thursday afternoon that we're recording. So I'll be able to go downstairs and maybe take a little walk before I try to process all of what we've been talking about. (laughs) Now, this has been such a great conversation. Um, I've really enjoyed myself and I want to say thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. You know, Everybody who's listening to this, you're helping them in some way. So I want to say thank you to you for what you're doing. Mm. Thank you. That's so nice. Well, um, for our listeners, Jen's uh, LinkedIn profile and other links to get in touch with her and see more of what she's doing will be in the show notes associated with this podcast at elkinsconsulting.com. And I'm so grateful for Jen's time today. Thank you for joining me on Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will. Listeners, it's your turn. What evidence are you going to start pointing to that shows that you are resilient, that you are a badass? Collect a couple of stories tonight. The moment that you think about it, any time something pops into your head of something you accomplished, write it down. Collect the evidence so that that belief in yourself really starts to solidify smile what's the use of crying you'll find that life is still worthwhile if you just smile